Praise be Jesus and Mary. Amen. Today's saints are Franciscan martyrs, John Francis Berthe, Severin Geralt, and their companions who died during the French Revolution, uh, 1792 and 1794. Just a, a brief word about them. Word stealing, the stealing of words and giving them a perverse meaning and persecuting Christians um, to defend those words with a new perverse meaning is, is not something new. Today, Christians are persecuted in the name of uh, tolerance, for example, and, and, and inclusivity and diversity. And all of those words have their own perverse meaning, not what the name indicates, but a whole different ideology behind the word. And that's not new because it was the same thing back in the days of the French Revolution when John Francis Berthe and his companions were persecuted and even put to death in the name of liberty and equality and fraternity. So that's just a little uh, word of prelude about the saints and, and their glorious death as, as martyrs out of fidelity to Christ, his church, and specifically the Roman pontiff. But again, that's just a prelude because it's the gospel that I want to look at uh, a little bit more. Uh, uh, it's the gospel that I want to give a little bit more attention to today, particularly our Lord's teaching on fasting. Our Lord in the gospel says, the day will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them and they will fast in those days. Fasting can be looked at as a, a virtue so a good, holy pattern of conduct that perfects our faculties as human beings and makes, us, and makes us live as worthy children of God. Fasting specifically can be looked at as a, as a, a mortification and a temperance of our, our very strong innate desire to put food in our bodies in order to keep ourselves alive. That's called a concupiscible appetite. So it's a philosophical term to, to express that inclination that we have to preserve ourselves, to keep ourselves alive. And that inclination, because of original sin, is disorderly. So we tend to overeat. Now, the virtue of fasting is supposed to become, in us Christians, a pattern of conduct that is able, at will, to moderate that desire for food and to be able to say no to it just as easily as we are able to say yes to it. So the virtue of fasting, let me repeat that, is that pattern of conduct that helps us to have dominion over this inclination, over this desire for food, so that with the help of God's grace, we're able to just as easily say no as we are able to say yes. We all know that it's very easy to say yes. The virtue of fasting helps us to just as easily say no. By our regular way of life, we, we in fact develop the opposite habit of just saying yes. We're, we, have, we live in a pretty wealthy society. We have easy access to good food whenever we want it, however much we want of it. And, and we, we become accustomed to uh, habitually satisfying our desire for food. And we don't have many opportunities to develop that power to say no sometimes. And fasting, fasting is that virtue that moderates and controls this tendency. And it's something that we need to impose upon ourselves. Um, the church, of course, commands fasting to a certain extent. Uh, fasting specifically on Good Friday and Ash Wednesday is imposed upon the faithful. On the Fridays of the year and during, uh, on the Fridays of the year, uh, some sort of penance, not specifically fasting, is, is required of the faithful. So, if fasting is supposed to be a habitual way of acting, we can't just stick to the universal law of the church. So two times a year, observing fasting two times a year is not sufficient to form a real habit. The church commands something that is important, but then we, out of our own initiative and generosity, have to impose more upon ourselves to develop this habit, which has to be a repetition of good actions, a frequent repetition of good actions to really become a virtue. For example, a way of doing that is to impose upon ourselves fasting more frequently, such as maybe making that your penance on all Fridays of the year, or on um, uh, 
the vigils of the feast days of, of Our Lady. Before a Marian feast comes up, preparing for that feast with a little bit of mortification of, of, of our intake of food. And there are many feast days and memorials of Our Lady during the year. So, and that's a, a very traditional way that saints have honored Our Lady, in fact. This, this, this virtue, again, is something important to develop. If, because if we don't develop the virtue of, of fasting, then we cannot properly feast either. It's only when we know how to, how to, how to suffer hunger that, that we appreciate the joys of feasting and vice versa. It's only when we know how to feast as Christians, because there are times when the bridegroom is with us, when there are solemnities and, and moments of rejoicing in the church. It's only when we know that, how to do that that we can also appreciate fasting. So the, the two are, are, of course, complementary. But to conclude, every Friday, today being the first Friday of the month, every Friday recalls Good Friday, the day our Lord was taken away from us. So perhaps that too is an opportunity to more frequently practice fasting. Practice it on the first Fridays of the month as well. The church recommends that as a minimum to fast in some way, we limit ourselves on a given day to one meal that really satisfies our hunger, and then two others that leave us definitely feeling unsatisfied and no eating in between. It's something ridiculously easy, I would say, even though maybe a, for somebody who's a beginner, it's, even that is difficult, but it's a, it's a place to start. So maybe, I'll leave that to you to consider, maybe that's something that you could do the first Fridays of the month, recalling that our Lord was taken away from us, we can fast in order to then more fully appreciate when our Lord does come back, the feasts and the solemnities of the church, which are plentiful as well. Praised be Jesus and Mary, now and forever. Amen.